That's the theme from the Sears Radio Theater. Tonight, a program of love and hate with Cicely Tyson as your hostess. Here's a preview. Suddenly, everything is oriental. Mysticism, martial arts, flower arranging, food. Oh, well, at least they have not tried to deal with the complications of Chinese opera yet. The Sears Radio Theater will begin after this message from your local station. This is Cicely Tyson. Over here! Get that hose over here! We don't want the whole neighborhood to go! Inside the burning structure, there is a man named Chan. Why doesn't he come out? No one can answer that question but Mr. Chan. We can only sift through the clues that a look at his life might offer us. A master tailor, Mr. Chan fled from bandits, disease, and famine in his native China in 1928. He and his sister, the last living members of their family. In America, the mountain of gold, Sarah married a doctor named Shin and moved to San Francisco's Chinatown. Mr. Chan worked at a series of odd jobs, saved his money, and in 1933, moved to New York, where he opened his own tailor shop. The logic behind his move was that people in the East, dealing with cold weather, would have more clothes to sew. Such a shame, the rushing... The seasons change, but the people never do. Always rushing. Where are they going? They never seem to pause for a deep breath or to look closely at anything as I look at my sewing machine. Gadgets. They have a gadget for everything. Some piece of machinery to occupy every moment of the day. Cars, televisions, radios, telephones, toys. Junk. They realize deep down that they are surrounded by junk. And it makes them feel aimless and dissatisfied. Yes, that would give one a feeling of having no purpose, no goal in life to be surrounded by and addicted to junk. How oh, strange. Is this becoming a world in which I want to live? And that's just the beginning of our story. Sears Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week, brought to you in Elliot Lewis production of the Sears Radio Theater. Our story, Mr. Chan, by Odie Hawkins. Our stars, Joseph Campanella and Marvin Miller. The Sears Radio Theater is brought to you by Sears Roebuck and Company. Sears, where America shops. Keep, keep clear of the hoses, please. Keep, keep clear. Why doesn't Mr. Chan leave while there's still time? What reasons could he offer for allowing himself to be trapped? Once more, we must turn to clues in the past for an answer. We must listen carefully to the threads in the fabric of Mr. Chan's life. Mr. Chan made an oblique study of the woman as she barged through the door. 35, 38, dyed blonde hair, too much perfume and lipstick, about 15 pounds overweight. An insecure exhibitionist. She tossed four expensive-looking dresses out of the Formica sales counter and drummed her bright green polished nails as she impatiently waited. Are you the owner? He leveled a neutral look at her and eased from his seat behind the sewing machine to stand behind the waist-high counter. The alcoholic fumes spraying his face almost caused him to step backwards. I said, are you the owner? Yes, I am the owner. What can I do for you? A slight smile played at the wrinkled corners of his softly slanted eyes. She was obviously surprised to hear his clear, precise English. 
Well, I, uh, I'd like to have some seams let out in these dresses. You can do that, can't you? He fingered the label inside the neck of one of the dresses. Well-known American designer, good fabric, excellent workmanship. Yes, of course. I can expand the seams. They looked at each other across the counter. She, slightly taller than his five-six, looked at a spot above his head, her eyes blurry from vodka. Well, how long will it take? Perhaps it would not be necessary to let seams out in these dresses if you lost, uh, oh, I would say ten or twelve pounds. She glared at him. Her lips curled down hatefully at the corners, and she snatched her dresses from the counter. And just who the hell do you think you are? Mr. Chan leaned across the counter and rested his body on his elbows, watching the woman throw her dresses onto the back seat of a small, expensive Italian car and wedge herself into the front seat. People, don't they ever consider the possibility of being reasonable before acting irrationally? He shook his head sadly and strolled to his living area at the rear of the shop to heat more water for tea. Erect, steady, thoughtful. I wonder what goes wrong with some people. Why must they always seek the most incorrect ways to deal with their shortcomings? He returned to his machine, cradling a fresh cup of tea in his palms. A sarcastic expression flickering across his face as he spotted his other teacup on his work table. <laughs> and I talk about other people. How many cups are needed for one cup of tea? He took the empty cup to his kitchen sink. No sense cluttering things up with a bunch of empty cups. Imagine a young woman, certainly not older than 40, making preparations to become a fat person. Working steadily on the coat in front of him, he slipped in and out of a varied collection of thought patterns. A loyal Chinese son from 1 to 20, a victim of famine at 20, a married man at 25, a widower at 45. Ghosts. Fifteen years since her death. Fifteen long years since her death. Since... He could not remember what he wanted to remember. His ghost wife swirling around too swiftly for his mind to grasp. He steered his attention back to the cloth in front of him. Stitching, gluing the pieces of cloth together was always a return to reality. A wealthy customer... A rich man who loved handmade silk shirts had asked him once... M Mr. Chen, don't you get fed up sometimes? Fed up? Yeah, fed up, you know, sewing all the time. He smiled, remembering, and stared out of the window for a moment. How could you explain to someone who only cared about finished products what it means to create, to stitch a reality together? The same man had also asked, Mr. Chan, have you ever considered opening a shop downtown? This, this neighborhood has changed so much. What do you mean, changed? Well, you know, the class of people that used to live in this neighborhood have all moved, including me. <laughs> I don't see any difference. Well, what I mean... Oh, I know what you mean. I've seen the color of the people change, but I'm still the same. I have not changed. He finished the suit coat, turned the closed sign around to the outside, locked the door, and prepared himself a lunch of pork strips with bean paste, a bowl of rice, and, as always, hot tea. He used his chopsticks as though they were surgical instruments. After his meal, he slouched against the back of his favorite chair, sighed deeply, and calmly looked around. The shop was all he needed. The shop and the living space behind it was his world. He believed that and was content. With his wife, Mr. Chan had had a home because she felt it was a necessity. She had been a source of strength and hope, but each one of the children had been born dead, three of them. And then she had died. Now there was only the shop, 
a facade, a counter to use for the defensive position, a wall of racks on one side, and five paces behind the counter, a heavy carved dragon screen that shielded his inner sanctum from the public. He dug into his pocket with one precise motion and pulled out a thumbnail-sized piece of jade, a gift from his father 40 years earlier. He held the piece up to the light streaming in through his window, turning it over to follow the dragon marbled inside. After a few moments of intense study, he slipped the jade back into his pocket. Old men, old jade, what does it matter in this day and age? Time to go back to work. He strode from the back and stiffened with mock seriousness when he spotted Leo's face at the door. Hi. What you doing, Mr. Chan? Hello, Leo. How are you this afternoon? Leo did an eye-blurring double shuffle, a perfect imitation of his idol, Muhammad Ali. I'm doing pretty good. Like, hey, life couldn't be better. I could have more of it, but it couldn't be better. Mr. Chan frowned at the small, tight-muscled, dark-skinned, nappy-headed figure making restless movements in front of him. What will happen to him? Blacks are almost Chinese in their will to survive. He lives three blocks away with seven brothers and sisters in a basement that was once a dog kennel. Life couldn't be better. You want me to go shopping for you, Mr. Chan? Mr. Chan slowly nodded yes and walked behind the counter to scribble out a few items on a piece of scratch paper. He strongly suspected that Leo couldn't read, but his will to hustle was worth a half dollar. Leo made a Brazilian dance movement through the door with the five-dollar bill clutched in one hand, the note for six items in the other. A half hour later, he danced back in. Here it is, Mr. Chan. Your tea and stuff. He checked the items off against the list under Mr. Chan's indulgent eyes onto the work table, not exactly matching each item on the list with that on the table. Letters were still not quite words to him. Rice, tea, two apples, Head of lettuce, chicken wings, and soy sauce. Thank you, Leo. There are two quarters on my sewing machine ledge for you. The bright voice chiming in his ears told him that he had lifted Leo's spirits, at least a half dollar's worth. People were always coming in with their cleaning, their laundry, or their stereotype notions. Uh, Mr. Chan, uh, do you know uh, anything about... Kung Fu, or, or, or acupuncture, or, or herbal medicine? Oh, and wasn't Bruce Lee something else? No, no, young man. I know absolutely nothing about any of those arts. I believe you have asked me these questions before. Oh. The tall, slender, dark-haired young man shuffled absently in place, fumbling in the back of his mind for some means to use to get Master Chan to speak the Tao. Uh, I'd like to, I'd like to have some buttons sewn. Where? Oh, uh, uh, buttons for suspenders. I'm, I'm going to wear suspenders with these. They, they say it's better for your lower back and all. You think? You may pick them up tomorrow. Oh, oh, thank you, sir. Oh, thank you very much. He held back his urge to laugh as he watched the young man bow a little too deeply as he backed out. Suddenly everything is oriental. Mysticism, martial arts, flower arranging, food... Oh, well, at least they have not tried to deal with the complications of Chinese opera yet. At twilight, he locked the door to the shop and retreated to his living space. For relaxation, 106 Tai Chi positions. For stimulation, the daily newspaper. He slowly lowered the newspaper after reading a few pages, his face distorted with disgust. Fools. The same old dreary sickness, the same old dumb acts, wars, people doing the same old stupid things. Won't we ever learn? He looked carefully around himself at his world. What need is there to go outside into that insane place? I have a large room with a toilet off to one side, ten shelves of the world's greatest minds, an old-fashioned stove with an overhung shelf, a comfortable bed, a window. His eyes paused at the high window placed in the rear wall. The window gave a perfectly cropped picture of a tree. The tree, more than any other single thing he could think of, gave him a feeling of being in harmony with nature. A place in front to make a living, a place in back to eat, sleep, read, a window. What else is necessary? 
so much unnecessary excitement in the world, people ignoring the wealth in their minds, searching instead for artificial entertainment. As usual, when he felt himself on the verge of becoming too excited, he heated water for tea. Sometimes, while waiting for the water to boil, he felt himself becoming so lucid that it seemed as though life were passing in front of his mind, and he could take an imaginary red pencil and cross out all of the weird, repetitious mistakes people were making. Do I think I am God? Hmm? Ground, assuming that we can feel that we know by now something of Mr. Chan's view of life? I would say yes. But we still haven't had an answer to our question. Why doesn't he come out? 6.30, Tai Chi Chuan, tea, and two slices of day-old bread with margarine for breakfast. He moves more slowly in the morning, having recognized years ago that he was an afternoon person. He stared at the budding branches crowding his window frame. In a few more days, they will be fully open. Wednesday, only two more days before the weekend, before I can close up and not be bothered for two whole days. An imploring face, making fish-like motions with his mouth through the glass of the front door, greeted him as he emerged from his living area. Uh, looks like someone needs emergency repairs. He carefully studied the face to make certain that it was anxiety and not larceny that he saw. It was anxiety. Twenty-some-year-old man, bloodshot blue eyes, a weak chin, nervous, and insecure attitude. So begins my day. And what can I do for you this morning, young man? Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. The name is Chan. Uh, Mr. Chan, you won't believe this. It may sound absolutely incredible to you. He took note of the hand-sewn kangaroo hide loafers, the well-tailored slacks, the well-stitched seams of the French-made shirt. His conclusion? A wealthy person. I can assure you nothing has sounded incredible to me for a long time. The young man, a Lawrence of the Evanston Northwestern University Lawrences, paused to fix a shrewd eye on Mr. Chan's face. Well, uh, in that case, here's my problem. I'm being pledged to Alpha Pi Gamma. Mr. Chan rolled his eyes upward and shrugged, body language that clearly indicated what his attitude towards Alpha Pi Gamma was. Yeah, I know it's nonsense, but it's the fraternity for my, uh, set. I mean, you're either in it or you're out of it, if you know what I mean. Yes. Well, I just gotta be in. My dad and uncle were officers in Pi Gamma when they were in college. Well, at any rate, I have ten challenges to meet. This is number six. What I have to do is have a suit made by Friday at 6 o'clock. You speak of this as a challenge. I don't quite understand. <laughs> oh, a challenge number six is to have a Chinese tailor who didn't live in Chinatown to make me a suit. They call it my Hong Kong challenge. I'm really fortunate to have found you. It was difficult for Mr. Chan to place the feeling he had. Just another piece of tailoring, that was no problem. Maybe he reasoned the disturbing part of it had to do with the young man being required to seek out a Chinese tailor. The challenge, phrased as though some coolie were being used to carry it out. It will cost you $400. Uh, it'll definitely be ready by Friday at 5? Definitely. Great. Now let us make a choice of material. Whatever you choose is okay. See you Friday. I gotta run. Challenge number seven lies ahead. Mr. Chan stared at the four $100 bills on the counter and at the bolts of cloth he kept underneath the counter and sadly shook his head from side to side. The rich, too bad about some of them. They think they can buy anything and have everything their way. He split the money into two piles, one pile for the legitimate cost of the suit and the other pile for other purposes. Maybe I'll send it to my sister in San Francisco. She likes money. He stooped to lift a bolt of old-fashioned gingham from beneath the counter, a sly smile sliding across his brain. Wonder how his fraternity brothers would like this suit. The pattern for a futuristic coat with zoot suit pants was already taking shape in his mind. 
Lester Chan didn't object to Nona Benson's presence in his shop. He liked her company, despite the fact that she had a peculiar, almost funny notion about him. On the positive side, they were both artists. She with her patchwork quilts. The problem that he had with her was that she loved to talk too much. Coupled to that was the notion that she didn't think that he understood English very well, which forced her, she thought, to lapse into her own brand of pigeon. He had decided not to try to fight her mistaken opinion of his language skills years back. Even when customers came in while she was there and he spoke perfectly normal English, she still refused to believe that he spoke perfectly normal English. Why you no go to night school? Learn English. You know what me saying? Oh, I have thought... Did your wife speak it? I say, you wife, she English speak? He paused in his work. Did she speak English? Had she spoken English? They'd always spoken to each other in Mandarin, whenever they spoke at all. Yes, he recalled she had spoken English, more or less. See? Now that's what I mean. You hear what I'm asking, but you don't understand. I can tell from the look on your face. I repeat what I said real slow. Now listen close. You wife, English speak, huh? Yes, my wife. Good, that's good. All you have to do is practice. After a while, it'll be easier, you see. I guess it's time for me to get on. Get my housework done. Do a little quilt. You quilting? Mm-hmm. I've been really up to my neck in quilts for the last few months. Bunch of ladies at my church, especially the younger ones, got it in their heads they just had to have a homemade quilt. They seem to think it's some kind of artwork or something. Ain't too many people do that kind of thing these days. Ain't really too much to it. All it takes is just sitting down, and after you get your materials together, just taking your time to put things together right. Yes. You take it easy, you hear? Think about that school thing. Remember, you're only as old as you feel. She sprinkled her fingers gracefully at him as she strolled out of the shop, calmly, unrushed. Her voice seemed to echo in the shop. He paused in his work. School. She always seems to leave something behind, some thought, an idea. School. The young lady standing at his side caught him off guard, having popped through the open door while his attention was elsewhere. He hated to have people catch him daydreaming, thinking about the past or future. It gave them the impression, he thought, that he might be senile. Uh, Mr. Chan? Yes? Uh, my name is Monique Feldman. He stared at the young woman's hand. He had not shaken a woman's hand in years, and never a Chinese woman's hand. Or was she Japanese? Her handshake was firm, her palm warm. Oh, I know. You're puzzled by my name. My husband is Jewish. He nodded slightly to indicate that he understood her explanation, but was still puzzled. Is she Japanese, Chinese, Thai, or what? So tall for an Oriental. Hard to figure out what's what with this younger generation. Mr. Chan, our agency, the new Asian American Alliance, is doing a citywide survey to determine the number of Asian senior citizens and find out how we can be of service to them. He felt tempted to invite her to have some tea with him. It was so nice to meet someone who cared about others. I do not need any help of any kind, Mrs. Feldman. Thank you. She seemed to be depressed for a moment, and then her face brightened. Well, I'd like to leave my card, just in case. The New Asian Alliance would like to help in any way we can. You see, we help secure health services and provide you with domestic aid if necessary, offer you meal tickets that can be used at the Asian Alliance Center. The address is here on the card. And we'll also provide you free transportation to the senior citizens' outing that we sponsor twice a month. All you have to do is give us a call, and we'll try to do whatever we can. Uh, my name is in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Feldman. Well, thank you for being kind enough to allow me to disturb your work. My pleasure. She surprised him by bowing, an expression that stamped her in his mind as a well-bred young person with a sense of tradition. He studied her as she strode out of the shop. Legs like a white woman. Taller than all the women of my generation. Very businesslike, honest, sincere. The new Asian-American alliance. Wonder what happened to Oriental. Oh, 
Oh, well, new times, new titles. Really nice of people to think of other people. No doubt in my mind, with her good manners, she must be Chinese. That evening, he had gone through a half dozen unreasonable situations, including a visit from two men who insisted that he buy a transistor radio for $50. Oh, come on, Pops. We know you got some money. Yeah, we know you got some money. All we want is $50. You give us 50 bucks for this cute little old radio here and we won't be bugging you no more. How dare you come into my shop and threaten me? Get out! Get out, both of you, and stay out! Hey, don't push. Be cool, man. Yeah, be cool. We were just trying to sell a little merchandise. Out, 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 out! That evening, he sat in his favorite chair and stared through his window at the paleness of the moon, the freshly budded branches making dragon patterns in the foreground mentally flicking back through the horrible designs the woman had asked him to sew. But, lady, don't you see? Drawstrings or thick elastic at that point of the legs would hinder circulation. Clothes should not constrict. I hardly see the point. After all, this is the 20th century, and people no longer dress for comfort. People dress for style. Yes, unfortunately, that is too often the case. I'm sorry I cannot join the fashion parade. I believe more in people than fashion. He leaned forward in his chair, identified the noise. The wino ghosts are starting to drink at my back door an hour earlier these days. He shuffled away from his chair to heat water for tea, poured himself a cup, and returned to his chair, feeling old and tired. So many crazy people running around. Maybe it's the food they eat that drives them crazy, all of the stuff with sugar in it. Too much false energy. They bounce around like rubber balls, the children worst of all. Some people eat too much, some people eat too little. What is so difficult about practicing moderation in all things? Telephone slaves, crazy wars between people of the same race, religion, and color and wars between people of different races, religions, and color, all the same, stupid. The old against the young, young against the old, the top against the bottom, and vice versa. And they excuse it by saying, that's the way it's always been. Fools. So much unnatural pain in the world. People have forgotten what real pain is. The pain you have when a loved one dies or you stick a needle in your thumb. They have developed synthetic pain, pain that they deliberately cultivate and try to treat with pills. Strange drugs that cause more pain than they cure. He placed his teacup beside his chair and pulled his jade piece from his pocket. It felt cool to his touch. What in the world happened? In my lifetime, a 60-year-old man, I have seen life lose its meaning. The rich have more and the poor have less. Of what? Money or madness? What does it matter? We, all of us, are being murdered by the air we breathe every day. Even the babies. A breeze stirred the branches in front of the full moon rippling a lovely jagged pattern within the picture frame of his window. He rubbed the smooth jade between his right thumb and forefinger, the moonshine glistening on the tears that slid down over his high cheekbones. wherever you can work safely. Someone has said, the seed for at least one contradictory act rests in all of us. There are people who seem to be living an exemplary life one day and become murderers the next day, offering us no obvious clues for their behavior. Mr. Chan, a sane, logical, and very humane individual, may have suffered at the last minute from a contradictory impulse. Each of us can reach our own conclusion. Only Mr. Chan really knows. Cicely Tyson again, with the concluding act of Mr. Chan. Oh!
Oh, that's a superb job, sir. Really superb. There's just something about the oriental sense of aesthetics, you know, of the yin and yang that makes, uh, uh... Um... Mr. Chan fixed a blank expression on his face and stared past the pale young man, immediately realizing that he had made a mistake. If I stare past him trying to blot him out, he'll think I'm being inscrutable. Or that I'm meditating or something. Damned if I do, damned if I don't. Uh, if you recall, Mr. Chan, Leo Tse once said... That will be two dollars, please. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, yeah, two, two dollars. Oh, uh, thank you, sir. I, I hope we can talk again sometime. I find that I know a little more each time we talk. You, you recall the proverb from the Tao, he who speaks does know, and he who does not speak... No, no I mean, no, he, he who speaks does not know... Mr. Chan pocketed the payment and folded his arms across his chest, momentarily forgetting the sage-like image that was projected by that gesture as he watched the young man bow out of the door. He had to grip himself inside to keep from laughing as the young man bowed back in. Oh, I, 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 I forgot my pants. The comical customer gone, the urge to laugh gone, he stood behind the counter, his arms still crossed, watching people enter and exit the picture frame of his shop window. They are like robots on a treadmill. The thought depressed him so badly, he sat immobilized at his machine for five minutes before he could get back into the spirit of sewing. Whether they knew it or not, the door of Mr. Chan's shop was the stage entrance for his customers. His moment to grasp their rhythms, form a notion of how they felt about themselves and him. He had started joking with himself in his 50th year about painting another sign under R. Chan, Door Psychologist. They revealed themselves when they walked into his space. In the colder months, it was more difficult to figure things out because people and their vibrations took time to thaw. Spring and summer were rich times for Dorology. Some people peeked into his shop through the screen door in the summer. He hesitated to put the screen up until the flies became too annoying as though they were looking into a tunnel. Others opened the door and staggered in, not quite certain of their reasons for being there or anywhere. The black people in the neighborhood tended to ignore him. To them, he was simply Chan, the Chinese tailor man, Miss Nona Benson's friend. They didn't want any suits made, and they did their own sewing. The Puerto Ricans also ignored him, but from time to time, shyly asked him to put a communion dress together. Those Asians who patronized him, even the non-Chinese, showed deep respect for a man of his age who practiced a religion that needed no preaching and was a master of his art. He had problems sometimes with a certain type, the kind of people who had recently acquired money in some odd way and thought it would be in to have a masterpiece from Mr. Chan. The more he suffered from their attention, the more in he became. The others were just like everybody else. They simply wanted someone to put something together that they were too lazy or didn't know how to do themselves. He stopped stitching to give his full attention to the figure standing in the half-open door. The fraternity brother-to-be, dressed in a little boy blue outfit, complete with ruffled shirt, straw bonnet, and a sun-sized all-day sucker. He looked ridiculous and knew it. Oh, this outfit, uh... This is one of my challenges. Uh, now, uh, my suit. You got my suit done? Yes, I have it right under here. Here you are. The fraternity brother-to-be stared at the narrow cuffs, the ballooned knees, the bullfighter's waistband, the zoot suit coat with the narrow lapels, and blinked. I, uh... I didn't specify what style or what kind of material, did I? No, no, you did not. You were in a rush. I had to make a guess at your measurements. I must tell you, I almost decided not to do the work, but I promised I would have you a suit this evening, so here it is. I'm sure to create a sensation one way or another. <laughs> Maybe they'll see the funny side of it, I hope. At any rate, my Hong Kong challenge has been met. Perhaps I could drop back in and pick out the material for a couple of suits one day when I got lots of time. Any weekday, my shop is at your disposal. I am open from 7.30 till 4 in the winter... 8.30 to 6 in the spring, summer, and fall. Oh, great. See ya. He felt a slight tinge of affection for the fraternity brother-to-be, for the sensible way he had chosen to deal with the gingham horror suit joke. 
Alpha Pi Gumbo. Ra, ra, ra. Friday evening, the shop door locked. His chair positioned in the twilight room to study the moon play through the budding branches. Two days older since he had last noticed them. He rocked slightly, intoxicated by the luminous ray that washed over his frail body. His life flashing through all the seasons he had sat, staring at the moon. Scenes of a China the world would never know again flickered through his mind. Ghosts. Thousands of people in a line. Their rice bowls held out, begging for food for a chance to live. Coolies, men with bitter strength, hauling loads on their backs that an animal would crumple under. Faces so lean from hunger that the bones of the skull show through the skin. No food of any kind. Grass, bark from the trees, leaves, all eaten. Famine. Diseases, people starving to death, burning with fever. Mother, father, older brother, dead, cremated. Someone trying to break in? Hey, looks like I'm on the line, man. He leaned back in his chair, his body alert, but relaxed. <laughs> just why no ghosts? Nothing to worry about. They are just killing themselves. He pulled the jade piece from his pocket and rubbed it in his hand. He strained to see a slow-moving herd of clouds pass between the budding branches and the moon. Coming out of a deep sleep a half hour later, the blurred outline of a bad dream still in his brain, he could smell something wrong. Money, always money. People robbing other people for it, stealing, cheating, doing anything for it. For coins and paper that never grow warmer, no matter how many hands touch them. It was smoke. He could identify the odor of the cloth scraps he threw in the alley trash cans. For a moment, he stiffened from the impulse to get out of his chair to escape the approaching fire. The wisps of smoke drifting up past his window held him in place. The farther up the scale we go, the more unlike animals we become. At least animals are honest with each other. He squeezed his eyes shut, tried to blot out all of the horrible pictures his mind held. Maybe they have all been bad dreams, all of them, all of it. For a moment, he felt completely divided, one part of himself straining to move to safety from the fire, the other part straining not to move. The two forces neutralized him. A stone facade and a wooden body of poor quality. Dishonest workmanship. The small neighborhood group milling around outside Mr. Chan's gutted shop swelled with excitement as an ambulance crew wheeled his body out of the smoking wood and stone. The damp odor of wool adding another element. Leo, his dancing feet planted solidly on the sidewalk, sobbed quietly, tears tracing clear patterns down the sides of his young old face. <laughs> Mrs. Nona Benson, a flowered handkerchief held to her face, mumbled over and over through her tears. I've been telling him the learning for the longest time. Maybe he didn't want to learn any more than he already knew. The Sears Radio Theater has been brought to you by Sears Roebuck and Company where our policy is satisfaction guaranteed or your money back. Sears, where America shops for value. Mr. Chan was written by Odie Hawkins, produced and directed by Fletcher Markle. Your hostess was Cicely Tyson. Our stars were Joseph Campanella and Marvin Miller. Featured in the cast were Paula Winslow, Don Diamond, Lou Horn, Corey Burton, Mady Norman, and Don Blakely. The music for Sears Radio Theater was composed and conducted by Nelson Riddle. This is Art Gilmore speaking. The Elliot Lewis production of Sears Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI.